This is Anthony Pascal. And this is Lori Elster, and this is the All Access Star Trek podcast. And today is a very special day because we have a very special guest, <laughs> Brian Drew of the ShuttlePod podcast. Hi, everybody. Happy to be here. Welcome, Brian. Welcome back. Oh, thank you. Happy to be back. So we knew we had to have Brian on because we are going to talk about the new William Shatner documentary, uh, You Can Call Me Bill. It's called. Mm -hmm. Um, And Brian and I went. Brian and I went to the premiere in New York City. We had a great time. We watched the documentary. Shatner was there doing a Q and A with Neil deGrasse Tyson. So we are going to tell you all about that. But first, we're going to do a news roundup. That is the other reason we have Brian here, which is that we are going to talk about my favorite topic. (laughs) Business news. <laughs> but it is important. And so we have these two smart guys, Tony and Brian, who know all about these things. And then I can be the person who asks the dumb guy questions. So right. why don't you guys say what tell us what's going on? I don't know if we've mentioned the name Apollo before, but they are a private equity firm that expressed interest in Paramount, which has been for sale for a while. Wall Street Journal reports this week they put in an official bid for $11 billion, but not for all of Paramount. They apparently want just the studios, the TV and film studios, which there's actually quite a few within the Paramount global umbrella, including CBS studios, which makes Star Trek, but like MTV studios makes all the Yellowstone things and Paramount pictures, obviously, but they'd leave everything else. And this was like big news. The stock shot up in a big, big way. And then less than 24 hours after the Wall Street Journal reports that, the Financial Times reports that Sherry Redstone, who still controls Paramount because she owns the the good shares, and we'll get into that later. Oh, I can't wait. (laughs) Is apparently unconvinced. And she's been behind the scenes working with David Ellison on the Skydance bid. They haven't put in their final bid, but apparently they are looking at buying all of it which we know is her preference. Yeah. And I think just from a ownership standpoint, I think I'd much rather have David Ellison, who is actually somebody who likes movies and loves movies, gain control of the company as opposed to Apollo, which will very likely take it and break it up into pieces and sell it for parts. I actually think what they're more likely to do, if you look at their track record, they're not vulture capitalists. They buy companies, monkey around with them, improve them, and then sell them like eight years later. So they aren't flippers. A lot of what they do is they buy two or three companies, combine them, streamline them. You know, and they own part of le- uh, Legendary Entertainment. They do. Yep. They've had some other media assets. I could easily see them trying to build a bigger studio t- t- to compete against maybe the likes of Warner Brothers or NBC Universal out of the Paramount Studios. It'd be like Sony focused on creating content as opposed to having their own distribution. Sony has no, none of their own distribution, so they don't have a streaming service. They don't have a, a broadcast channel. So I, I, I don't dismiss the Apollo bid as just, you know, they're out to destroy the company. All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. But let's say Apollo bought the studios, but not the streaming networks. What are the uh, different possibilities that could happen to Star Trek at that point? I mean, it's not just that they wouldn't buy the streaming networks. They wouldn't buy CBS. They wouldn't buy MTV. They wouldn't buy anything. They just want production. They right. don't want any distribution. Right. There's a million different scenarios. But the big question is what happens to Paramount? Uh, plus, I, I, you know, does it just get shut down by what remains of Paramount? Because I think what would happen then is what remains of Paramount would just get sold off in pieces right. in, in the Apollo deal. So Very CBS likely. would go to... I think Warner Brothers Discovery would like to buy CBS because they want those sports rights and they'd like to have a broadcast network. And, you know, Byron Allen would buy MTV and, you know, everyone would buy a piece. Paramount Plus, big question, it probably would end up being bought and merged with another streaming service. Right. Peacock, Max, somebody. They're not just going to shut it down and it disappears. You know, they have a customer list. They're almost profitable. You know, so it's kind of the it would be dumb to just say, oh, let's just get out of this business entirely. They 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 do what they could, but it would change. It would transform. Right. And the Star Trek shows 
I think that was part of your question, right, Lori? Yes, I was waiting. I, I mean, they might sell, <laughs> they might just start selling them to other outlets, and which means they might be spread all over the place. Yeah, but if the new Paramount Plus that let's say it's Paramount Max, Max Plus or whatever, you know, I they think we got to call it Mountcock like we did before. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they you know they could still buy Star Trek shows from the Apollo owned Paramount entity, um, which would be a separate company. Um, and, but then that Apollo owned entity could quite possibly start licensing current and new Star Trek content to others. Right. Or to different places. Right. So there would, there could no longer be one home of Star Trek. They've already ripped that bandaid off by, you know, licensing prodigy to Netflix, but we could see one Star Trek show on, on, uh, prime and one Star Trek show on Paramount max and one Star Trek show. Mm -hmm. on something else but they would have to be i mean if if this were to happen they would have to be very different shows to very different demographics because no one would want to be competing against like you wouldn't have a show like picard and strange new worlds on two different services because there's a little too you know they'd it'd be more likely like the academy show versus strange new worlds are different enough that you could see those on different services that's a great point yep right i still think that the Apollo deal or the Skydance deal combined with spinning Paramount Plus into and merging it with another service, having that service no longer be the exclusive home to Star Trek, but have it always have it like one or two Star Trek shows, but then have Star Trek also licensed to others. That's my kind of dream scenario for mm-hmm. three, four, five years from now. So there'll still be, you know, three or four active live action and animated Star Trek streaming shows maybe maybe just down to two or three and they'd be different and possibly on different streamers and then all the people who complain about having to pay for star trek will have to pay more to more places ha ha <laughs> uh the idea of siloing all your programming onto your own service even if you own it that's becoming very old hat old thinking very quickly yeah i you mean know? disney can pull it off because they're disney yeah but they're it but look at what they have right I mean, that's what you mean by saying they're Disney, too. Like, they have they have a lot of, of loved properties. Right. But they are apparently willing to do some licensing, but they'll never do it with the Marvel and um, Star Wars. Right. Basically, you know, we don't have all the answers because there's still a lot of questions. This is more long term. So what's in production now? is almost certainly going to end up on Paramount Plus in 2024 and 2025. These kinds of things take time. So this is more about 2026. Or late next year, maybe. Which might be when this Starfleet Academy show is ready. Yeah. I mean, anybody who's out there who's watching all this is afraid that like Strange New Worlds is going to end like next week. (laughs) (laughs) I wouldn't worry about it. If Paramount Plus were to fold on December 31st, 2024, on January 1st, 2025, someone will be running Star Trek programming, brand new Star Trek programming, Strange New Worlds, whatever. Yeah. Star Trek is safe. It's just a matter of where it might land. Right. I think the long-term future of Star Trek is multiple locations. But, yeah, I think so, too. I mean, well, that's you know that's already happening because, again, yeah. Prodigy. I'm actually hoping that's good for Prodigy because I'm hoping that more people will see it because more people have Netflix. Yep. Yep. And, you know, the Academy show might live better somewhere else that has, you know, a younger demographic available to it. Mm-hmm. It could possibly do better on Netflix, too. Yep. I still think that these kinds of deals can definitely help the feature films because they need a cash infusion from either private equity. Well, the Skydance deal is also fueled by private equity. So it it's not the same thing as a hedge fund which people keep on calling it that, and that's a whole different thing. I'm not going to explain why. Thank you. Yeah, Apollo is not a hedge fund. (laughs) You know, I mean, they have a lot of success. I mean, they have this, you know, a very strange portfolio, but that's because they're very diversified. So they own like ADT, you know, and they own Hostess and, you know, they owned Harris. They buy companies, they turn them around, but they don't, you know, they saved people's jobs with Hostess. Now, not everyone kept their job. But a lot of people did who were about to lose their jobs, you know, and right. I don't see them as corporate raiders. That's good. I'm glad, I'm glad to hear you say that because that was my at first blush. That was my initial reaction. 
Like they're just going to strip it for parts and maybe that's their goal. But I, I think they're more likely going to look to buy other assets. You'd look, you could look at Lionsgate, you could look at AMC, these, yep. these studios, all the ones that aren't in the top studios, you could cobble together a pretty decent sized studio with a lot of IP. Yeah. But that's been the case for a while now. And it hasn't, nobody's had to, nobody's decided to do that. Yeah. Well, you know, Apollo has over half a trillion dollars. They do. You know, they they dole out ten billion dollar buys all the time. Right. This thing could get ugly if Sherry wants to do the deal with Skydance, but Apollo offers more money, which is a better deal for most investors, but not the special super duper investors like Sherry. And right. you could end up with a situation where, and we've seen this before, where there's shareholder lawsuits or or the board says we're sorry, Sherry, we're going to take. The cash, the better cash deal, even though you want to work with David Ellison. Right. Unless David Ellison and his dad pop, you know, they match or beat the deal and then everyone wins. Yeah. Yeah. It's still, it's all very fuzzy still. Let's pick up on a couple other kind of corporate y things. Um, At South by Southwest last week, one of the people there, whenever you watch uh, any of the Star Trek shows, at the end, you'll notice there's this thing called Roddenberry Entertainment. That's Rod Roddenberry's company, which is kind of a legacy of Gene Roddenberry's company. And it's their job to oversee the vision of Roddenberry and make sure Star Trek productions, you know, adhere to Roddenberry's vision. And, you know, so Rod Roddenberry and his uh, Trevor Roth are executive producers on like every Star Trek project. But that doesn't mean they're, you know, they aren't in there doing the hiring and the stuff like that, but they're kept. They were executive producers of After Trek when I worked on it, and they were not in our studio or, I mean, Trevor, we had weekly calls with Trevor where we would just tell him what was going on. But yeah, they're kept in the loop. They know what's going on. So I think it was Screen Rant. Someone was talking to Trevor on the red carpet, asked him about the feature films, like what's going on with the feature films. And he said, you know, don't worry, there's a plan. So he said that there's every intent for a new movie coming out in the very near future. But he also said, there's a lot you don't know that is happening behind the scenes that could make things a lot more difficult, which is what we've been talking about on this podcast, which is there's there's a lot of shit happening behind the scenes that has been keeping the Jenga Tower from being put together because people <laughs> keep on pulling, you know, one block out and it always falls apart. <laughs> yep. Apparently someone's putting the Jenga Tower back again. We'll see if this happens. What do you think, Brian? I mean – do I think there will eventually be a Star Trek movie? Yeah. In the near future. Do you think they could make it by the 60th anniversary? I mean, if they're already deep in development on something we don't know about, yeah, probably. Well, they're in theory deep in development. They've run through multiple scripts on the Star Trek Four project, which is now supposed to be the last one. And then a prequel, which is supposed to be this a jumping off point for a you know new series of movies. Yeah, well, I guess the question is, which one of those would it be? And Brian, just because we haven't talked about this with you, do you think they will ever be able to do a, a sequel like a Star Trek Four with that cast? If they're going to do it, they better do it soon. I mean, I feel like if they're going to do something with the, with that cast, they sh- that should be the next movie. I mean, it's been eight years since Beyond. That's almost the length of time that the original series, between the original series ending production and TMP starting. I mean, it's a long time. This is not the young crew anymore. They are the middle-aged crew of the Starship Enterprise. Right. So it's like, if they're should, if they going to do something with that group, that should be the next thing they do. Well, that has been their plan, you know, since 2016. It just keeps on getting derailed, and then they do something else, and then they come back to it. Well, that's what makes me think maybe it's, not going to happen. Yeah, it quite possibly won't. Yeah. I mean, there there are people who want to do something different. I also think it comes down to math, too. Yeah, getting that group back together would cost a lot of money. It's the magic spot of is the only way to get that group back together for a movie that needs to gross a billion dollars, and then you're like, well, no Star Trek movie will ever gross a billion dollars, so then you can't get them back together. Like, is that right. the math? Can you make a movie for 150 million? which sounds like a lot, but isn't with all of them and enough money left over for special effects and to pay a director. I guess that's always been the question with Star Trek movies though. We've talked about this in the shuttle pod many times. The big problem with Star Trek movies after a certain point is the above the line costs swallow so much of the budget that after you finish paying everybody, you have nobody, no money to make the movie with. Yeah. Right. 
You know, TN- and TOS some of these- was like that. TNG was like that. And uh, this this crew is definitely in danger if they were to. You know, the these guys thing. are busy. Like Zoe Saldana is doing a million things and Carl Urban's doing a million things. Yeah, and, they're all busy. You know, they've all got all a lot going on. Yeah. But they all, they genuinely like each other. They'll generally do something, especially if JJ's involved. They all love him. You know, the motivation is there. You know, apparently Paramount's willing to pay them. Um, but so we'll see. I, I think that there will be some feature film by 2026. That's maybe I'm just a cockeyed optimist. <laughs> That's how we all think of you. I th- I'm sure the studio would like to have something out for the 60th. I, I mean, that it's an obvious. They've always tried to peg a, a feature film to the big anniversaries. So we'll see. But if it's going to happen, it's got to go into production by the end of this year. Otherwise, forget it. Well, it would be a tight fit, Tony. Look what happened with Beyond. I mean, it depends on if you're doing summer or winter, but you need to start production roughly maybe 16 months before release. So, you know, you could start early next year. That's kind of um, like, yeah, the end of this year, beginning of next year. You got to have yeah. something rolling. Hey, maybe it'll happen. Like you said, that they've they've never stopped them. It never stopped them in the past from going for the obviously obvious merchandising poll of an anniversary. So maybe we will get something. What was the other business thing? George Cheeks. Oh yeah, Cheeks. George Cheeks. I just wanted to say George Cheeks, but he is the, <laughs> the CBS CEO, and he was talking to Vulture, and he was asked how how uh, CBS fits into the broader Paramount Global Universe, mm. which he said he he called it mission critical, and then he included the Star Trek universe as sort of proof that CBS has proven it can drive engagement and is valuable. He has less moon versus old job, but that also includes running CBS studios who produce all the Star Trek stuff. Right. You know, Cause all that Yellowstone stuff, as I said earlier, is actually produced by MTV studios and there, and there's other studios. So in a way there's a competition within Paramount. Yeah. Global. These little fiefdoms. Yep. You know, and of course they make a lot of, you know, like the, those CBS procedurals, which are a huge driver. And yeah, but he brought up Star Trek, which I thought was interesting. Um, and then the interviewer from Vulture, you know, f- very mainstream press says, well, are you scaling back Star Trek? Why haven't you given Legacy a green light? Mm. So here's my bet. I bet he's never even heard of Legacy. Yeah I, I was, I, yeah, I think the way if you yeah, when you're reading it, it's like reacting like he's he has absolutely no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it reads. That's totally how it reads. His answer was, you know, we're not scaling back. We're timing things out. Alex has a long-term plan. But he cert- he did not use the words legacy when he was answering the question. Right. I could imagine him getting on the phone afterwards and saying, That's Alex. What I, was, I was just thinking, like, right after he's asking his people, what's legacy? Wait, what is this? Do we need to do this? What is it? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Hopefully he Googled it and read an article on TrekMovie.com. <laughs> It's good to hear him say positive things. We've heard executives say positive things, but it sounds like they certainly don't want the world thinking they're scaling back on Star Trek, even though Picard yeah. ended, Discovery's <laughs> ending, you know, Prodigy's moving. This is what Alex said at New York Comic Con last year. He's like, Paramount Plus loves us. There's stuff in the pipeline. But if they don't announce anything else, literally nothing's in production next year. So we're now getting to the point where they need to start talking about what's happening next year. Right. Well, I assume that if they're going to renew, if they're going to give it, I mean, I assume it'll be renewed anyway, but I assume that the official announcement of a renewal of Strange New Worlds is maybe we'll hear about that at the end of production of season three, which should be soon. But maybe. Yeah, they've jumped ahead before and done that. I think even before they've, I thought they did that actually with after the first, when the first season. Sometimes, I mean, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Yeah. Sometimes they anyway. wait. But well, we've got Star Trek Day. We've got Comic Con. There are right. dates this year, you know, d- where these. Th- I mean, in theory, people seem to think there's a big thing coming on First Contact Day. There's like a rumor that they're going to announce Legacy on First Contact Day. Um, that is not going to happen. Um, yeah. I wish it were going to happen. It I don't is not think that's happen. really been a big day for them. I think they've scaled it back. Yeah, you know, the season two trailer for Picard came out on that day, but uh, yeah, they, they've used it for other things, but. They're not going to announce a new show on that day, probably. But sometimes, like, you know, I remember that one day where they announced, like, they're buying a new season of everything. It was just a random Tuesday in January, you know. So (laughs) you never know what they're going to do. They tend to use these big events more for trailers and reveals as opposed to announcing new shows. Right. And, I mean, I know everybody wants this legacy to happen, but, like, 
as we've seen in articles that we've published on the site and Terry's got no reason to lie. And he, Terry Metalis, and he indicates that there's nothing going on. right yeah. Now, then again, that could change like that, but, but nobody's as of, tricking as of like or two lying. weeks ago. Yeah, yeah. It's not, it's not really a thing. Now maybe George cheeks is like, he's, you know, he's all for legacy now, you know, <laughs> he's been Googling. He's like, this thing sounds pretty cool. It's, <laughs> it's trending on Twitter. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> All these nerds are talking about it. Maybe we should do this. So I guess that's it for the business news. I made it. You survived. Hopefully <laughs> the did. listeners did as well. <laughs> oh, no. That, I mean, honestly, like people are interested in this. Like we know that people are interested in this. Yeah. So I'm just I feel like I have to represent for the people who are like, I don't want to hear detailed business stuff, but I do want to understand what the effects of this could be. And I think you guys did a nice job of explaining that. It's the unfortunate thing about this, of course, though, is that it, it, there's so much ambiguity right now. Right. There's market trends happening that Hollywood is scaling back across the board. It's not yeah. just streaming. It's everything. There's a lot less scripted content across the board. You know, so even if Paramount was in good shape, you know, even Netflix and Disney are pulling back, you know, so the winners are pulling back. Everyone's pulling back. Yeah. But Star Trek will not be going away. That's the headline. Right. That's always my headline. Um, <laughs> so let's move into some production updates for the shows that are happening, um, which is Anson Mount posted a very fun video on Instagram today. He, he gave a nice tour of his trailer, talked about his hair, uh, but he gave us a little update. They're starting episode seven. Of season three out of ten. Right. That's basically the schedule we assumed they'd be on to finish by the mid-May. He said he's doing something he's never done before. He didn't say big swing, did he? No, but oh. I mean that could be that could be anything. It could have been like the musical. It seemed more personal to him. I mean, it could be anything. It could be a practical thing. Like, I don't, you know, has he ever done wire work before? Right. It could be yeah, a difficult acting challenge of some kind. Yeah. Who knows? Maybe he's playing a woman. They're doing a remake of Turn About a Tritter. You know, so maybe he's doing like a masks thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Kayla would love that. <laughs> the big news is he's a huge fan of Coke Zero. He's got a fridge chock full of that stuff. <laughs> he does. It was it was impressive. I mean, and a little disturbing. <laughs> His hair was extra high, by the way. Even yes. he was, even he was like, "Damn, this hair is high." <laughs> but he That's- hadn't. He he had yet to go into makeup. So that right. which means it was. Like naturally that high. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody's hair is naturally that high. <laughs> he rolls out of bed with like it was way up there. I yeah. mean, he was like, whoa. So you're saying yeah. that was you're saying that was his bedhead, Tony? Damn. <laughs> I think so. I don't know. <laughs> so the other big thing was last week I said I thought section thirty one had wrapped. It actually wrapped this week on mm-hmm. Wednesday. Um about a week late. My bet is uh, Michelle Yeoh got some extra time to go down and present at the Oscars, and that you know cost them a few days. Yep, worth it. And I don't see her; she doesn't seem to be the take the red eye, get in and out quick to get back to production type. I think she's like, I'll take my time. I'm going to L.A. I'm going to go to a few parties. Right, I'll and- be there when I'm there. <laughs> yeah, or for all we know, she might have had that in her contract anyway. Uh, probably. So one of the actors guy named Robert Kaczynski it apparently is just a huge Star Trek fan. So when things wrapped up, he posted his goodbye. You know, when you wrap up, they give you a wrap gift and it was, you know, a flower and a bottle of wine and his seat back. Um, and he just wrote how fun it was for him to be in Star Trek. He's just super jazzed. You know, he seems to be a Todd Stashwick type guy. He's just really into Star Trek, just su- super excited to be there. I love when the new people come in and they're old school fans who just love it, who are so excited. Yep. He wrote in his Instagram message, I hope you guys like what we've made for you as a diehard Trekker. I think you'll love it. What may get him in trouble is he was tagging the other actors, but he tagged people we didn't know about. So Uh um, that weren't in the official announcement. Now, none of these are major People, probably none of them are people you've heard of, but now we know three more people and we have no idea. So it's got a cast of 10 in in addition to Michelle. No idea what any of them are doing. Right. But they're done. Yeah. Yeah. My guess is trailer by Comic-Con release after Lower Deck season five, like uh, November, December. Do you think maybe maybe. a teaser trailer for First Contact? No, too soon. Yeah, but even the – okay. 
I mean, maybe. I mean, they did start shooting in January. They could have some footage. If anything, an image, you know, her on yeah, a maybe. ship or something. Yeah, um, maybe something but, like that. Yeah. So as of May, all live action production will be done, except for Academy, which we talked about extensively last week, is going to start in the summer. Right. right. That's what Kurt's been told us, right? And, you know, uh, Lower Decks, they're continuing to plug away. We still don't know anything about Prodigy. It's We know it's not coming in April because Netflix announced their April titles and it's right. not on it's the not list. There. Right. Picardo guessed May for random reasons. Who knows? It's done. I, I understand they're done with everything, even the dubbing. Like it's all yeah. just sitting yeah. in a bucket somewhere. Yeah, it's been on ice for a while now. I think. Well, yeah, I mean, there was like, you know, the, the, the because Netflix is Netflix, you got to dub it into Uzbek and, you know, and all that you know, <laughs> right. stuff. So, <laughs> but uh, apparently all that's done. I don't know if they dub it into Uzbek. I just made that up. I like that. I'm going to get that version. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they'll do a tribute to Shatner and have it dubbed in Esperanto. <laughs> <laughs> that is a deep cut. That's a deep we'll cut. get into that later. Yeah, that's basically it. I mean, we we got a couple of discovery things. Obviously, last week was we did a lot of discovery stuff, and there's more coming. Uh, there's a lot more coming next week. <laughs> All the red carpet interviews are up on the site now. The panel video, the whole thing is up. You could watch it and a bonus video. There's some new posters. The panel video. If you are a discovery fan and you like that cast, you will love the video. It's delightful. It's just so sweet and heartwarming and there's crying and it's fabulous and I, I just and Scott Mance is doing the interview and at one point he starts like on something about the original series and then like stops and he's like sorry 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 and then he just goes back to discovery but it's great like they're just they're they they do get emotional for good reason and they're funny and there's just I'll always love this cast there's something special about them they're a tight bunch there's no question they always say it starts at the top, and you know, Sonequa is just the nicest person in the world, and she's very sweet. You you just couldn't survive in that cast unless you, you know, followed suit. I think. Well said. You know that's what they say on the panel too. They're like she led the way. She had personal relationships with each and every person, and set the tone for everybody. I am very interested to see where her career goes next. Yeah. It's a good question. I mean, she's, you know, this role, I think, did her well for her career. She had a good supporting role on Walking Dead. I think now she's, boy, she was in uh, the Space Jam movie, but that didn't do very well. Well, she has a new movie now that was also at Sundance with, that's a Legion M movie. Right. That was at Sundance with Discovery. And she had, she also had done uh, Once Upon a Time. But she has, what she's gotten to show in Discovery is range. I think within... 10 years, she's heading up like NCIS, you know, New Orleans or whatever, you know, she's, <laughs> she's destined for some, you know, for leading a strong procedural cop show on CBS someday, yeah. I think, you know, <laughs> or, or what, what is the one that NBC, you, they have all the, the Chicago something, yeah, Chicago name something. And Fire? They've done that one. They got fired yeah. police, and I don't know. I don't watch any of those shows. I don't know. Yeah, my, my mother does. <laughs> yeah, my mother-in-law does. <laughs> All the CSIs, I think. <laughs> I think it's time for us to talk about Mr. William Shatner. Yes, let's do that. And the documentary, You Can Call Me Bill. I mean, do you want to start with the event? I've seen the documentary. I did. I'm not going. The, the event is literally happening now in L.A. But I, I choose to be with you people. Aww. Aww. you're a fool. You're a fool, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> um, you could have hear... it up, Captain Kirk. That's true. So, why don't you guys tell me and everyone what the event was like in New York? I mean, it was in Alice Tully Hall, right? At Lincoln Center. At Lincoln Center. It was a beautiful day. Um, Lori and I had the no frill seats, otherwise known as the TJ Hooker seats. <laughs> yes. All the tiers were named, had had names, and the lowest tier was yeah. the TJ. So people were coming up to us in line going, is this the TJ Hooker line? We're like, I guess it is. <laughs> yeah. What were the, like, is the negotiator above the TJ Hooker line? Like, did Everything they... is above the TJ Hooker line. Yeah, I think okay. there's like a Denny Crane line and... Uh... I, I think they did have the negotiator. They might have. Yeah. Yeah. And the top tier has to be Kirk, right? 
Right. So much money. I don't know. Lori and I didn't bother paying any attention to that stuff because the amount of money they were asking for that. It was for access to Shatner and all sorts of other stuff. And it was just outrageously priced. The event with the place was packed, absolutely filled to the brim. And everybody was very enthusiastic. It looked the the screening, the, the quality of the screening itself was first rate. It was sounded great. It looked great. Yeah. The mood was great. Like we we ran into Yvette from Sci Fi Sisters and and a bunch of other you know, some other people that we knew, which was really fun. Yeah. There was a and A with William Shatner and the director and of the documentary and Neil deGrasse Tyson. Like yeah. every city that it's premiering in has a different person. We know Mark Altman did one. Um and Kevin Smith is doing the Kevin LA Smith is one. Doing tonight. The one in LA, right. Yeah. So we had Neil deGrasse Tyson, which was very cool. To just talk to him afterwards. But in classic Shatner fashion, though, instead of people asking those people, the, the two of them asking him questions, he spent most of the time quizzing them. Of yeah. course. So I really wasn't so much of a question and answer with William Shatner as much as it was almost just like a round table thing almost. Yeah. That's a good transition to the documentary itself. I mean, the, the surprising thing about the documentary is that maybe 10, 15 minutes in, you're like, I'm not learning about William Shatner. I'm learning from William Shatner. He's here to teach us lessons. He's here to talk to us. You're not learning about the things that have happened to him in his life. You're learning what he thinks about things with sometimes his history woven in and great clips. It's nonlinear, even though it's broken into sections. It's not like childhood a, you know, early adulthood. Yeah, it, no, at all. not traditional documentary. When they say section three, you're like, I don't know how many sections there are. I don't know how far away we are because it isn't following that thread. Right. Yeah, they're more thematic or philosophical. And it's very stream of consciousness. You almost feel like, like the director, I don't know if he had a plan when he approached Shatner. This is how I'm going to do it. But it's clear that he decided he's just going to follow along. And then as Shatner spoke through these extended interviews, he beautifully finds footage Mm -hmm. from Shatner's career. And it could be from the movie he did at Esperanto or, you know, random Western he did that you've never seen before from the 50s. I mean, a lot of Star Trek, admittedly. And it all helps emphasize the points Shatner is making and it's all Shatner all the time. There's no, it's not like they bring in people who work with him, (laughs) you know, all like none of the normal documentary stuff you might expect is there. It's Shatner on Shatner, but it's really Shatner on the universe. It's almost like a, a Ted talk at times. It is like the, the books he's been writing lately are like that. Yes, they are. And I mean, look, any of any of us who have been to Star Trek conventions and watched him, he does a lot of the same kinds of things at the conventions. He yeah. starts to espouse about his own views on things and what's interesting him at that moment. And it's very, it reminded me very much of a convention appearance. But sometimes those can feel meandering and random. Yeah. Yeah. What's what the director does is he makes it gives it a structure. It's not a typical structure. But it's still a, a structure, and the clips and the archive footage, and every once in a while they'll do a recreation or a dramatization. Very rarely, but like some key stories, like the Shatner story of when he was after Star Trek and he was broke and he was watching the moon landing. They did a recreation of that. Right. Very tastefully, very, like you never see the actor playing young Shatner there, but it sets the tone well, I felt. So you know, I, I loved it. I thought it was, even though it was like, like what I, after I started watching, I'm like, this is as weird as, you know, one of his talks. But then I'm like, but no, this is kind of the only way to do a William Shatner documentary. I mean, you could, we, History Channel could do a, a history of William Shatner, and that would be interesting. I would love that because there are also, I mean, his game show era didn't make it into the documentary. A, a lot which, of stuff didn't make it. And there's it. a lot of stuff that didn't. And he's what the documentary did tell us, for anyone who didn't know, was just how extensive his career is. Because people seem, a lot of people think like it was Star Trek and everything that came after. Oh my there's God. a lot of stuff that came he before. He had a whole career before Star Trek. Yeah. William Shatner was, was a star. 
landing him for the for Star Trek was a big deal. People don't realize that. That was a big deal. And he'd worked with everybody. Yeah. Like he knew everybody. So he was talking at the thing. He was talking about working with Tyrone Guthrie. You know, he's a major Shakespearean director. Like, Edward you know, G. Robinson. He had some good, a good Edward G. Robinson Yeah, I mean, he story. was in Judgment at Nuremberg. He's working with Spencer Tracy. I mean, like, yeah. Spencer Tracy. Right. You know, it's, he, he did the Brothers Karamazov with Yul Brenner. I mean, the guy has done stuff. He was on Broadway for a long time. Yep. I mean, I don't think it's fake humility, but he is quite humble. I mean, he, he talks about the craft of acting a bit. That's one of the themes of this thing. But he's very humble about his career. The thing he seems to value most about himself is his insatiable curiosity. Mm-hmm. Yes. And his passion, which passion. are intertwined. Yep. You and, know. of course, horses. And horses and dogs. <laughs> but, I mean, it's like I do find that after I read – like his last book and also um, watching the documentary, like the next day I'm talking about stuff that he talked about. Like he is thinking about the nature of the universe and death and animals and all these different things. And it just inspires you to think about these things for yourself. I mean, he's in his nineties, he's looking back, he's trying to find knowledge. He's always pursuing something new. And that's what keeps him going. I mean, I, you get the feeling that he thinks that if he slows down, he'll die. He's Oh, he has said that. He's pretty much just yeah. said that over the years. I, I, I do want to say one thing about the, 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 the documentary. I think if you're a person like I am, and I know Laurie is, if, you've been, if you follow his career closely, you read his books, I think you get even more out of that documentary. Because about 10 years, when the, he wrote a book about Leonard, that book Leonard that he wrote right after Leonard yeah. died. I, in my experience, I've been following Shatner's career since I was a little kid. And I, in my opinion, most of the time, he's been very guarded about his life, his feel, his real feelings about things. He's just kind of kept everything at arm's length for whatever reason. When he wrote the Leonard book, it was the first time like he opens up about how he feels about certain things. He tells a story about, I think he was up in Canada, or maybe he was in upstate New York. He was in a bad spot where he was in a bad storm. And like this bridge starts to collapse and he narrowly like avoids getting away. He, like, he came close to dying. And he said, he thought afterwards, he was wondering if anybody would care if he was dead. I, he talks about loneliness a lot in the documentary. I think he feels alone a lot. I think he does too. I mean, I, mean, I it's think interesting, he, that's like- his plea for like, he, that's his, I think a lot of the things that people interpret as arrogance in his life are not arrogance. It's an awkwardness. Well, one think- of the five chapters is called loneliness, and I felt like that's the one where he got most honest. Yeah, and I yeah. also think – like he has daughters and grandchildren, but I think his last really close friend was Leonard Nimoy. Yeah. Who they didn't end on good terms, and he didn't really understand what was going on at the time. But he doesn't seem to have like a bunch of buddies that he's always – with right. like that he's tight with and he admits that in one of his books that he does not have any close friends yeah and he, I, he says it in the documentary he says yeah. i have no i have no friends now i you know apparently there is a kind of cabal of people who go to monday night football at his house and it's a it's like a hot ticket to get in hollywood right yeah but, he's been doing it for decades yeah but still yeah he, he said that, you know he's Friends with his loves, the women he's loved, his yep. wives and his current wife. But yeah, he has. Now, when he said, I have no close friend, I was thinking he he must mean alive. Because. You know, right. You know, well, you lose a lot of people at his age. Right. Yeah. So it's, he's, he's not saying he never had friends, but I mean, it does get this thing gets dark. It does. It's obvious he's thinking about death. It's obvious that's why he did the documentary. He's thought about death a lot. I've sort of, I've seen many interviews with him over the years, especially once he hit his sixties. He mentioned like being aware that death was always nearby. Like he's ter- he's absolutely terrified of dying. It's, it's very obvious. Well, it's not, to, not you know, that I blame at, him, but you know, yeah, who isn't? Um, at the Q and A, um, audience members could ask questions. You scan a QR code, fill out a form, ask a question. So I got a question in, and it was like what. I said, you're an accumulator of wisdom. What do you wish you'd known sooner? Um, and he was like, that it's all going to end. <laughs> that was his answer. Yeah. Like that it's going to be over. Now, if you are 
a Star Trek fan and you're watching this for Star Trek, there is a good amount of Star Trek in it. There is. Both in the clips that they use and every once in a while, because again, it's nonlinear, it just kind of weaves in and out of Star Trek. So he'll suddenly just start talking about shooting the pilot and why he thinks the his version worked better than the Jeffrey Hunter version. Right. And then 20 minutes later, he just starts talking about his death scene and then he gives himself a redo. I loved that. Yeah. He, he didn't yeah, like that was good. the version. And so he, he, he does the line reading again and it's better. He also talks about like laughing with DeForest Kelly and Leonard Nimoy and all of that. So that's nice too. Yeah. There are Star Trek things to appreciate throughout. Right. But that's not what it's really about. No, it's not a making – this is what it was like on the set. He doesn't talk about Gene Roddenberry and Gene Kuhn and Bob Justman. I don't think any of those names even – did even Roddenberry's name get yeah, mentioned? Yeah, I don't think Gene even gets mentioned, no. Yeah, I mean, so it's 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 just not a making of. There are Those things exist out there, but that's not them. what he was into. You know what I'd forgotten because they were showing clips and he was talking a bit about – I was forgot that like T, about T.J. Hooker – and just how much that character was just an awful person. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and Shatner makes it very clear in the documentary. He was kind of an asshole. Yeah. Right. All the Denny Crane talk made. I've never watched that show. Oh, I, I love like Now I really uh, want to. You, you'll, lo- you'll love it. It's got a great cast, great writing. Yeah. And he's fan- he I'd and like James it. Spader are delightful in it. And James Spader's such a nut, too. So those those are that's a good combination. It is. You wouldn't think they would. You wouldn't think they would have like chemistry together, but they have crazy chemistry. Well, because James Spader is weirdly thoughtful in a strange and quirky way. Yeah, true. It, he's he's quite good, and he you know he talks about this. He is a storyteller, and he is good at turning these memories into stories. You know, you know, going back to his childhood. Although you could tell, like when it got into stuff about his parents and his mom and his dad. Oh. He just didn't want to talk about it. Yeah, although I found it sad. He's written about it. I never heard him up and up about his mother like that before, though, that his mother was kind of distant. Yeah. That has an effect on you. That was heartbreaking to me. And I thought I thought it actually explained a lot. Yeah. Because he so. talked about, like, longing for that mom. He said he never called his mother mom who would like hold you and tell you that everything was going to be okay. And he talked about that in his book also, like just about his loneliness as a kid. You know, it's funny by the way, you know, he talked about his childhood growing up as a, as a Jew who was beaten up in Montreal for being Jewish. And I was posting about the documentary on my Facebook page and a friend of mine, her dad went to school with him and grew up with him. Willie, he called him. And said that they were the two Jews and they were always being picked on. And so my friend's father would run and Willie would stop and fight. <laughs> Which is, you know, terrible. And it's funny that he would stop and fight. But it's, I wonder if he did Kirk Fu. But, um, <laughs> but you know, he, ha- he had a lot of hard stuff going on. And, and if his mother was emotionally distant, that explains a lot. Yep. The thing that really drove it home was he's saying, when I watch sports and they kept on showing these scenes of these athletes in the, you know, when they come off the court and they go and hug their mother and like just seeing the joy of a mother and a son hugging each other to him seemed alien. And I'm like, wow, that is not normal. And that explains a lot. Yeah. 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 yeah I remember a couple of instances. Leonard Nimoy said he did not think William Shatner was an arrogant man at all. And Nicholas Meyer said that what you see as ego is actually very deep seated insecurity. It's not ego. He goes, I don't think Bill Shatner is an egotist. He goes, he's just very insecure. Yeah. Another thing I liked about the documentary is it's tight. It's 90 minutes, which is, I I think the sweet spot for documentary. Mm -hmm. You don't want to overstay your welcome. I think the structure works well. It, you know, it starts on a theme. It, it it brings you back to that theme at the end. It does. Absolutely. There's not too much of these Chatner interview where they're just on camera on him. They'll weave in and out of that and they do it well. I don't know if the lighting for that part was really well done as well. So it's it's more of a movie documentary than a TV documentary. Yeah, sure. No yeah. question. No question. Beautifully photographed, beautifully edited. Yeah. Mixes that. I mean, it's really first rate 
that documentary from a production standpoint it's magnificent it's highly recommended for star trek fans for shatner fans is there anything else i mean we could keep on praising caesar um or we could uh move on what do you say i think we can move on definitely worth checking out though folks no question I mean, do you have a fa- I mean, favorite boat? I would like fun little moments. I-, I thought one thing I thought was hilarious. I mean, just his, his recollection was amazing, but at one point he could remember the names of the stunt horses that he rode in the movie he made between seasons one and two of Star Trek, White Comanche. Right. Um, and I'm like, wow. I bet, I would bet that he remembers every horse name of his life. Probably. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised. He loves him. And, but he, he, I mean, that's the, the fascinating thing is that he will talk about horses, but it's, he makes you, he brings you into his love and he starts talking about what he's learned from horses. Yeah. Right. And what they can teach us all. He's constantly doing that of, of, you know, you feel like you're in the minutia and then he broadens out. I mean, and sometimes he broadens out to these galactic notions, you know, or, Envi- the environment and stuff. And if I, I mean, sometimes I think that's the director doing a very good job of turning something into a narrative when it may not have been that way on the day, um, but it's done very well. Anyway, do you guys have, it was a whole experience for me. I didn't really like view it. Nothing about it really as a, as a, a single event. We did have a funny thing happen to us after. Oh, well let's hear it. <laughs> which is that we're in the lobby leaving and some guy just came up to me and said, are you or Lori? And I said, yeah. And he goes, yeah. I love your podcast. I was listening to it on the way over. Thanks for all the work you do. So nice. Yeah. It's wild when that kind of thing happens. Yeah. I had a, cu- a couple moments like that when I was in San Francisco and uh, I lo- yeah, it's great. It's so nice. Never get tired of hearing of it. Yeah, I'm a glutton for it. Because yeah. <laughs> like Shatner, we're all insecure. Yes. We all need a hug. It's part of the human condition. Absolutely. All right. Well, why don't we wrap up with our bits of the week and we should let our guest go first. Okay. My bit is that Adam Nimoy, son of Leonard, is putting out a book about his relationship with his father, the difficult relationship he had with his father. And the way they reconciled in the years leading before Leonard's death. It comes out in June, June 4th, to be precise. It's called The Most Human. And I, for one, am very curious to read that book because he describes in the, in the brief excerpt that's in there, he describes having a pretty distant relationship with his father from when he's young and not having a really good read on his father and that they became estranged and there was a lot of anger and then there'd be some reconciliations and then more anger. And then it, it didn't really start to thaw until Leonard wrote his son a long note, a long letter. And that's where the tease for the book ends. So um, I think we all know that they got along better. Like there's Adam, I think, was more actively involved in Leonard's life late. You know, in the, well, and made his documentary about his dad. He did. And I remember a few years before Leonard died, when he was still physically active, he and he and Adam went up to Boston and Leonard walked him around to different areas where he had grown up. And showed him cool places, and here's where your grandfather's, you know, barbershop was, and all this other stuff. So at that point, they clearly had had the relationship had mended. So it'll be interesting to hear because one of the criticisms I've, that have been, have been made about Leonard Nimoy over the years is that Leonard could be very distant, and that he was more like Spock than I think most people might realize. So I'm curious to read it. It sounds like it could be a heartwarming story of reconciliation, and you know, finally getting past old wounds. Yeah, I'd like to read it too. And Adam also posted a link to photos, family photos. Some of oh, I haven't I seen know. that. I have to look. Yeah, I'll, uh, well, we'll post it. We'll put it on the post. Cool. But yeah, I'm but very, like he's I'm doing a newsletter or something and he's going to have regu- be regularly showing photos. All right. All right, Tony, what's yours? Well, mine is a, a bit of a follow-up. I can't remember. Did, did we talk about the article that Aaron did earlier this year that was looking at a, some of the 2024 Star Trek predictions? like sanctuary districts. And one of the other things was looking at kind of just a random line from the episode, the higher ground where they talked about Irish uh, reunification. And, you know, we looked at where things were with that. And I, he, I think he did a really good job. What's interesting is the BBC who didn't air that episode back 
when it aired originally, did a whole article on this. And the name of the BBC article is the banned Star Trek episode that promised a united Ireland. They got uh, Melinda Snodgrass uh, to talk about it. And it's just a really good, you know, it's the BBC talking about Star Trek and getting, getting a prediction almost right. Yeah. Got to check that out. That's cool. A lot of people sent me that article when it came out. And so your bit of the week, Lori? Mine is Star Trek adjacent, which is, uh, I saw this because someone posted it, but the Lieutenant was Gene Roddenberry's first show. And if you, and it's all on YouTube. So there was one season, like 20, I forget how many, 26 episodes or something, maybe more. So many Star Trek guest stars that you will recognize and writers and directors. And I decided to, I've never seen it. It's a good show. And they have all the episodes and they look great. They're in really good quality. So I watched the one with Nichelle Nichols, which also had, um, what's his name? Don Marshall, Dennis Mm -hmm. Hopper. Like it's Robert Vaughn is in every episode for like a couple of minutes. Wasn't Nimoy on that show once? He was on the show. Walter Koenig did one, which I was watching a little bit of also. Uh, Majel Barrett, like a lot of the main cast and then a lot of the guest stars. And then just a lot of big names, you know, people that became like the one I watched also had uh, Pilar Surratt, who's Dean Devlin's mom, who was in Wolf in the Fold. That's right. Um, playing a great role. It was a really good role for her. And also, uh, you know, just to tie things to the bionics, Oscar Goldman. What's Richard Anderson? <laughs> Richard Anderson. In, Anderson. He's right. in like four episodes. Richard Anderson was, in, was on every show and in every movie, it seemed like in the 60s and the early 70s. He'll always be Oscar Goldman. Too. Yes, but anyway, totally. it's a great find. And here's the main thing that, that I think is interesting. The themes, like it's Gary Lockwood is the star and he's this lieutenant and it's, you know, it's like during cold war times um so there's no actual war they're in california like he calls himself like a softy like he's trying to he's trying to do the right thing with racial conflict he's trying to do the right thing with women like it's i don't think there was other tv like this at the time like it definitely when you watch it you'll realize that star trek probably couldn't i don't i don't think it could have happened without it separate from like deals and he was an existing producer but like thematically it's it's the first footprint. I believe the lore is that Roddenberry ran into issues trying to deal with some of these issues. Yes. Yeah. The lieutenant. One of them didn't air, I don't think, because it was controversial. It had something to do with the mer- like criticizing the Marine Corps. It might have been over well, a racial thing. I, I forget. And so Star Trek was a, a way for him to use science fiction to tell some of these controversial stories when it's easier to get away with in a science fiction setting. Yep. Definitely. When you see Nichelle Nichols, I actually loved her performance because she gets to be just a little bit edgier about racial issues. And they say things out loud. I mean, it is it's it's rather extraordinary. I'm going to watch the rest of them. Yeah. It's a shame it only made it through one season. But if not for that, yeah. no Star Trek. That's right. So that's it. Is that enough? I think so. I just want to mention one more thing. Tomorrow... After we record this, March 22nd is William Shatner's 93rd birthday. So, happy birthday, Bill. Happy birthday, Bill. And then, do you know what's the day after that? I don't know. Someone else's birthday? My birthday! (laughs) I always love that my birthday is between Shatner's and Nimoy's, because Leonard Nimoy is the 26th. Yes. Although, for many years, I didn't have a really good Star Trek celebrity on my birthday. And now, Amanda Plummer. And I share a birthday. Cool. Excellent. So, but happy birthday, Bill, and happy birthday, me. Happy birthday, Lori. <laughs> happy Thank birthday, you. Lori. Thank you. Where have you registered? <laughs> <laughs> My <Ew>. fellow Aries. <laughs> and uh, we'll be back next week with our pre Discovery season five premiere interviews and discussion. And then in two weeks, we'll be reviewing two episodes because there's two coming out on April 4th. All right. So, yep. Get ready. All right. We'll see you then. Bye, everybody. Goodbye.